What an honor. What an honor. People always ask, Stephanie, why do you do what you do? Because your story is so dramatic. And I say this, I do what I do because I love Jesus. I absolutely adore my Jesus. And there is nothing that I could do to outgive the love that he has given to me. So that is the first reason why I do what I do. Second is, I believe that when I read the word of God, there are elements in the Bible that weaves it all together, and it is this. God never makes mistakes. There is no child born on this face that was a mistake as far as God's concern. Because when Jesus came and he died on the cross, he absorbed every human being's mistake. And God's design is this, that he wants every child to have that original perfect beginning. And yet, I stand here knowing that's not my story. And we heard a story that that is not God's original design for our brother that was up here. But the beautiful thing about the cross of Jesus Christ is this, that when we come to that realization that the world has beaten us, that the world has betrayed us, that the world has abandoned us, that the people that God intended to give us, that nurturing that we needed to become the adults that he wants us to be, he will come and take the place of the father. He will come and take the place of the mother. He will come and be the family to us that we need so that no matter what the age that a child is rescued, from that point, God can pour in all the nurturing that that child needs to be the successful representation of who he is. And God uses men and women like us to make sure that for every child that is abandoned, for every child that goes hungry, for every child that needs medical attention and schooling, every child that needs someone to throw their arms around them and say, it's okay. Don't look at what the world is giving to you now. It's okay. God has a different plan for you. And as we speak those words, that we know that we can be the advocates to change either one child's life or change a country's destiny. I come from a small peninsula just off of Mancheria that's called Korea. Just a tiny little country. And after the Korean conflict, where I lived was even tinier because that little peninsula was divided into two. North, to this day, is the darkest nation on the face of the earth. South, today, thriving in every way. But when I was born, little South Korea was not like that. For 40 years, they had been occupied by the Japanese that had tried to come in to colonize that little peninsula. For three and a half years, they had fought a bloody war for independence. Little South Korea was devastated. Every tree that was burnt from the mountains, people that had lost everything. And on top of that, there were little girls and boys running around their country that they called Tugis. And what these little girls and boys represented were children that had been fathered by the Allied soldiers that had come to fight along with the soldiers, but in the process of whatever their stories were, they got involved with the Korean women of that country. And these women gave birth to these children. These children had no 
IDs whatsoever because in Asia, unless a father or a grandfather or an uncle says, this child is of worth, I am going to give her my family name. And if that child is not given that uh, recognition, that child has no status in that country. I know very little about my mother. I have vague memories, but very little memories. I know nothing about my father except that he was probably an American GI. But my memory starts very vividly when I was about four years of age. Now, I say four years because I'm trying to calculate back from the year that I was given when I was adopted. So trying to calculate back, I was probably around four years of age. I remember vividly holding on to my mommy's hand. And if my memory serves me right, she was beautiful. She had this long black hair. But I remember her face being extremely sad. And I were walking down this country road in the country of South Korea because she had told me that we were going on a train ride. I had never been on a moving vehicle. And to go on a train ride was like, you know, Disneyland to a, somebody here. And so we were walking down the street and she was telling me the story of what the train was going to look like and what it was going to feel like. And we got to the train station and she placed me on the train. And she handed me this little bundle that was wrapped up in a little cloth bag. And she said, go. Get off when everyone else gets off. And when you get off, your uncle will be there to meet you. He's going to take care of you because I can't take care of you right now. And I remember that beginning of fear that started as I looked into her eyes and said, but mommy, are you going to come for me? And she assured me that she would come for me. That's the last time I met my mother or saw my mother. I went on this train, listened to all the noises that were around, watching the landscape as it changed. And it came to this fairly big city and it stopped and everybody on my car was getting off. And I remember being told, get off when everyone else gets off. So I got up, but I stood on this wooden platform waiting, 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 waiting. It began to get dark and the station became quiet, but nobody came. But I knew I was to wait. And finally, out of the darkness, a train master came and he looked at me and he said, Tuki. Now, in the village that I had been raised by my mother, I had been called Tuki, but more as a curiosity. And, and I'm sure my mother must have called me by a different name than Tuki, which is like a word that represented who I was, a child of dust and nothingness. I'm sure she had another name for me, but from that moment on in that train station, I do not remember my original name. Tugi became my identity. You half-breed. You mistake. You child of no nothingness. And he said, Tugi, you need to leave. Uh, I can't leave. My uncle is coming for me. And just for a second, I'm sure there was like, you know, a recognition. He must have seen this before. And, and he said, Tuggy, you can't stay here. You have to leave. Where does a little girl f go to when she finds that she, it's dark and she has nowhere to go? And I remember moving out of that train station and looking to the side of the train station, and there was this oxen cart that was leaning, leaning up against the wall. And, and I took my little bundle that my mom had given me, and I crawled un underneath that oxen stall and that little oxen cart, and I covered up myself as best as I could with the straw that was around that place. And, and I opened up that little bundle, and it was a little rice ball and a little pickle and a little boiled egg that she had put together. And I hadn't eaten all that day, so I ate that food, thinking, in the morning, my uncle will come for me. But a little four-year-old, all alone, 
beside a train station, listening to all the night noises. I remember this fear starting to rise within me. I gathered that little cloth bag that my mother had put my lunch in, and I put it up to my neck like so many children do with their little blankies. And I said, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. My mommy's going to come for me. My mommy's going to come for me. My mommy's going to come for me. Morning came. I ran back to the train station, stood on that platform, waiting for a face that I didn't know what he would look like, but certainly he would come for me. And at the end of the second day, again, nobody was there. Again, at the end, the train master said, Tuki, you need to leave. You can't stay around here. No one's going to help you. Walking out of that train station, crawling back into that oxen cart, second day being so hungry because I hadn't eaten the whole day, and gathering that little cloth and putting it up to my face, saying, no one, no one, no one is coming for me. Mommy, 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 where are you? I got up the next morning, I stood on that railroad tracks. I knew that the train had come one way, so if I followed that track, maybe I would come back to where I had started. So four years old, I start marching down that track, hoping to find my way home. For the next Three years of my life, I wandered the railroad tracks that I found, the villages that I found, the mountains that I found, trying to find the original village that I had started from. Three years. Two winters. Ohio winters is very, very cold. The South Korean winters are horrible. You get the Siberian wind that blows in from Siberia. You get the Mongolian winds that blows in from Mongolia. You get the Manchurian winds that blow in from Manchuria. And the snow begins to fall towards the end of October, and it doesn't disappear till March. Where does a little girl go when she has nowhere to go? I realized within a few days of leaving that train station that my life would never be the same again. That I, for me to survive, I had to find my own food. For me to survive the nights, I had to find the place of sleep where it was safe. For me to survive from the elements, I had to learn to fight and to crawl my way just to make sure that I did not get what the world wanted to give me. But in the three years that I wandered on my own, I learned what it was to face cruelty of men and women that have no sense of love. Now, I need to say something real quick here. My people, the South Koreans, are amazing people. Since the beginning of war till now, they are a group of people that have rose themselves out of all the conflict that they were living with. And they have embraced the Lord like no country has. Little South Korea is the Christian nation in the world today. They have more churches and more missionaries than any other country in the world, including the United States of America. They are the fifth economically strong country in the world today. They are the most educated people in the world today. They have come such a long, long ways. But 50 years ago, 55 years ago, that was not the case. They lived in superstition. They lived in the fact that when they looked at a little girl like me, they were reminded of what their girls went through, what their nations went through. 
that they would never be a pure race again, that they would never be able to pick themselves up from all that they had lost. And so when they looked at little girls like me, they wanted to get rid of that reminders. And besides, I wasn't even a person. They did not see me as a little girl that when I bled, that I hurt like their little girls. They didn't see me that when I begged for food, that I was hungry like their little girls. That when I asked to find a little warm spot to sleep at night, they didn't see me as a little girl like their own that got cold at night. But I stand here to tell you that when I look back on my child and I see the moments where I should have actually just died, how God always sent someone, even if it was for half an hour or for an hour or for an evening or just a little time where that person came and somewhere deep within, although I had not been introduced to Jesus yet, even though I didn't know a God, somewhere deep inside there resonated a spirit that was looking for the true spirit and that spirit would rise up and say, it's okay, you can do this, you can do this. And I believe that it was a spirit that God gave me before I was born, knowing the journey that I was going to have. And he knew that I would have a story at the end to give him glory and honor. And he said, I'm going to raise her up out of the dust. I'm going to raise her up out of abuse. I'm going to raise her up out of this abandonment. And one day she's going to see there's no event in her life that she would be better without. Because the testimony of the cross is he took everything that the world took away from us and he gave us everything that heaven's intent for us was. I found myself one day in a village very hungry and I was trying to steal some food from the farmers that was gathering their foods to sell for that day and I was caught by a group of farmers and one of them recognized me, and he said, oh, it's that dirty toogie that's wandering around our rice fields. We have to get rid of her. And the other um, farmer sort of chuckled and said, yeah, let's take her to the water wheel. I knew what the water wheel was, and I didn't want to be taken to the water wheel. I fought, I screamed, but the farmers were much, much bigger than I, and they dragged me out of the village up a mountainside, and there was a small water wheel that in Asia they use to irrigate the rice fields, and it sort of travels really slowly, but it travels as it irrigates the rice fields. And they took me up to this water field, and, and they tied me face up, arms tied behind my back, legs tied down, and I remember the way where the sun was set in the sky. And I remember watching the clouds as it was playing in the sky. And I remember hearing the scream of the little girl that was me as my face began to go backwards. And I knew my face was going to go in the water. And just before it went under the water, I held my breath. And I came back up and I spit out whatever was in my mouth and I began to scream again. The water was not very deep, so when my face went down, my face would scrape the mud and the sand and the gravel that was on the bottom. I'm here to tell you, I believe I should have died on that water wheel. There's no reason why I should have survived. By I had been on there long enough where the skin was starting to rip off of my face. My eyes were beginning to swell shut, and I didn't have any more cry of mercy left. All of a sudden, the water wheel stopped. I felt the hands as it began to rub my hands and untie the rope that had tied me. I heard the voice. I could not see him because my eyes were so shut. But I knew these hands were not the farmer's hands. They felt soft. It was not rough like the farmer's hands. And he took me off the water wheel, and he placed me on the ground. And I remember a soft cloth as it was being wiped off, as it began to wipe the debris off my face. And I heard this voice say to me, little girl, it's very important. You need to listen to this. 
these people do not understand how much you need to live. But little girl, I'm here to tell you, you must live. I'm laying on that ground listening to this man telling me that I must live, and now I'm about five years old, maybe five and a half. I lived on the streets maybe for a year. And he's telling me to live, and I don't understand this two message. But somewhere again, this little light, the little me, began to rise up and say, oh, he's telling me to live because if I just go over the next mountain, my mommy is there, and she's waiting for me. She's looking for me as much as I'm looking for her. He must know my mommy. I fell asleep or I lost unconsciousness. I don't really know exactly what happened. But when I came to, the man wasn't there anymore. I opened my eyes as best as I could with the swollen eyes. I looked around and I realized for that day I needed to stay close to that water wheel because I couldn't see. Here I was, left alone again. Why was he telling me that I needed to live? But if I could get enough strength and if I could open my eyes, it wasn't that far over the mountain. And in the next village, my mommy would be there. And that gave me the hope and the desire that I needed. And sure enough, my eyes began where I could see again and I could get up and start walking. And I had this, live, little girl, live, little girl, live, little girl, live, little girl. The children would catch me over the months, throw me into human septic wells, watch me as I was trying to fight for my life in that sewage, that sewage, and, and uh, as it was being sucked under, the children would laugh at me, and just before I could even cry for help, they would pull me out by my hair, and I would lay by the septic well, smelling the smell of human waste, and believing this is who I am. This is who I am. I am nothing but human waste. But that man told me I have to live, so I'm going to wash myself in the stream, and I'm going to keep on walking because I have to live. Another time for daring to steal some food from another farmer, they took me to an abandoned well and threw me in to die in this hole. And I should have died in that hole. But again, at the end of the day, a woman came and I heard her voice saying, little girl, are you down there? I didn't have anywhere to go, you know. And she said, I'm going to throw a bucket with a rope on it and if you can somehow get the energy. And I had spent the whole day holding on to a rock and yelling up at this vacant darkness hoping that someone would hear me, but the echo of my own voice came back to me. But I kept saying, if that man told me to live, I can live. And she threw a bucket with a rope on it, and somehow I climbed into that bucket, and she pulled me up. And I'll never forget, she was an old, old Korean bent-over lady, and, and she grabbed me under the arm, and she sort of dragged me because she wasn't much bigger than I was. She dragged me through the village in the dark and took me to an oxen stall, and she covered me up with the uh, straw that the oxen were eating to get warmth back into my body. And of all things, she looked into my eyes, and she said the exact same thing that the man had said many months before. Little girl... I know your life is tough, but listen to me, little girl, it's very important. You must live. Why do I have to live? Because in the morning I will be hungry, and at night I will be cold, and children mock me, and they throw stones at me. They tie me to trees. They throw me into septic wells. They tell me I'm a witch when I come into their villages. I wear a straw mat as clothing during the day, and I look like a little wild thing running in the countryside. Why do I have to live but inside? That hope that said, there's more than what you have now. You're going to find your family. 
keep on, don't give up. Winters were the worst because there was no food that I could steal from the farmer's fields. There was no food that I could scavenge from the ground. It was very, very cold and there was nowhere for me to sleep. But the US soldiers and the Allied soldiers, when they fought in Korea for three and a half years and afterwards protecting the country, they had dug these little holes in the mountains, little foxholes, little burrows. And they became my home. And in the wintertime, I would crawl into these little burrows and I would gather whatever dry grass I could to put around me. But the winds would whip through that little hole and the fact that I survived night after night after night after night, week after week, months after months, that is a miracle again from God. But every once in a while, when I would brave myself to come out of that burrow because it was so cold and I knew I would die, I would crawl down into the village hoping to lean up against one of the mud huts that the warmth from their house would somehow warm my body. But several times when I would go down, there was one house that I could go to. This one housewife had seen me wandering. She had seen me when I was being beaten. She had seen me, but she knew in her culture she could not step forward to help me, but she would eye me, and she always gave me eye contact, which was very unusual with most people. And the first night that I went down there, I knew somehow if I went there, just maybe I could lean up against her wall. She had left her kitchen door open for me. I crawled into that kitchen mud floor with a little earthen stove and I warmed up to it as best as I could and she had a little iron kettle that had burnt up barley on the bottle, that bottom that had made into a little barley tea. And I remember drinking that thing and again that voice from within saying, live little girl, live. It's very important that you live. When I was about seven years old, I wandered into a fairly large city. And in this city was the first time I saw like taxis and cars and bicycles everywhere. And, and I'm trying to wonder how I'm going to survive in this metropolis. And I hear a voice, and it's a voice of a young boy. And, and uh, he sort of comes through the crowd and he says, Tugi, yes. You're new here. Yes. You need a place to stay. Yes. Oh, come with me. So I follow him. And in this city, on the edge of the city, there's a river that runs through the city. And everywhere that I saw were little makeshift tents and little makeshift huts that had been put together by, you know, metal scraps and barley um, mats and whatever else could be found. And there were children by the hundreds living in this part of the city. And it was sort of called the children's village. They had their own rules and they had their own um, infrastructure and that's where they lived. And, and so this young boy took me to this part of the city and he had a group of people that he was sort of their father to. And he said, you can come and live with us. No one had invited me to live with them. And so I began to live with them. When they stole food, they shared it with me. When they built a fire at night, I got to stay warm. But I'll never forget one night as we were around this little fire, there was a little boy about my age. He was standing in front of this fire and he was rocking back and forth. And I remember my eyes never left him. And as he was rocking back and forth, I thought, what is he going to do? And all of a sudden, he fell face forward into the fire. The other boys pulled him out, but he had burnt himself pretty good. They took him to the edge of the town, and I never knew what happened to him. But I remember going to bed that night thinking, he's brave. He's brave. I wish I could do that because my tomorrows aren't going to be any better than my todays were. I'm a toogie. 
but at that voice again inside. Live, little girl, live. One morning I woke up and a group of boys said to me, you've lived with us for several months now. We've taken good care of you. Yes, thank you. You need to give something back to us. I have nothing. I lost my innocence that day. I was gang raped at the age of seven. No one needs to tell a little girl when that happens that it's okay. I knew then that I had lost one of the most precious rights that a girl has. But in my mind, I said, they've given lots to me, so if this is what they want, I guess that's what I have to give. And I lived with them for several more months. But one morning I woke up extremely sick and feeling feverish and shaky at the same time. And, and I'm thinking, what's going on? And I'm rolling from one side to see if someone could help me. And that straw mat on that side is empty. I roll to the other side, and that straw mat on the other side is empty. And, and I get up, and I start calling for my family. And they're all gone. And I know that I'm sick, something is not right, but no one around in the other parts of the village can help me. So I'm thinking, okay, uh, we've been eating nothing but garbage and junk in the city and sewage water. If somehow I can get back out into the country, at least I can drink from a clean stream and maybe steal some of the vegetables and fruits that the farmers grow. And so in my weakness, I'm trying to get out of the city. And as I'm going out of the city, I hear another horrible scream out in the gutter of the city. And I look down, and it's another little girl that has been abandoned and thrown away in the gut sewage way and somehow in my weakness I crawl down to where she is and I pick her up and I hold her near me and I say it's okay we're both gonna survive and I'm thinking you know she's screaming so she's screaming because she's hungry right and I'm probably feeling the way I'm feeling because I'm hungry I can't make it out to the country but I know where the market is and if I can go to the open market maybe I can steal some food for her and I and at least it would appease us until we can get out and as I'm doing this walking into the marketplace I feel my head being grabbed from behind me and the little girl being yanked out of my arms because, see, they recognized me. I had stolen much of their food. And in Korea at that time, when you steal food, it was one of the worst things that you could do. And the farmer says, we got to punish this Tugi. She keeps stealing our food. And they said, well, let's take her to that building. I had lived in this city long enough to know exactly what that building was. It was a building that had been built on the edge of the river. At one time, it had been a government building, but now it, was, it had been bombed out. But what survived in that building were the gutter rats that came up the river through the ground, and it was like a breathing ground for them. And I remember screaming and saying, oh, you can do whatever you want, but don't take us to that building. But they laughed and dragged that little girl and myself and threw us over this wall, pretty much as live baits for these rats. Our brother was talking about having a pet hamster. It reminds me too much of a rat. I should have died in that building. I do not know what happened to the little girl that was thrown in with me. I remember waking up and looking into these blue, blue eyes. 
Now, again, I knew nothing about God. I knew nothing about Jesus. I knew nothing about church. But somewhere, maybe somewhere before I was abandoned, my mother or my grandparents or someone must have told me about Jesus or about heaven. Because the blue eyes that looked down at me, the first word she said was, that she said that came out of me was, am I in paradise? I thought I had died, and somewhere, maybe a picture book or something, you know, angels had blue eyes, right? And she assured me, no, you're not in paradise. And this is a story that was shared with me several years later by this nurse. She is a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed nurse that came to Korea from Sweden. And her job was to rescue babies that had been abandoned at train station, at police stations. And she ran a clinic and a small baby hospital for them. Her job was to get these children healthy enough that they could be adopted out internationally. International adoption had just begun in the late 50s and it started in South Korea to help the hundreds and thousands of children that were left and abandoned. She said she was going from one orphanage back to her clinic, and she felt compelled that day to go through what she called garbage lane. It was actually a landfill that it was being filled with garbage. And as she's walking through garbage lane, she hears this groan, and she comes over to where this groan is, and it's me. I cannot tell you how I got out of that building. I don't know if somebody found me and thought I was dead and just threw me on the garbage to die. I don't know if somehow I got out myself, and in my wanderings, I ended up on that garbage pile. I cannot tell you, but that's where I was found. For any of us that work in a third world country, like I do, with Loving Shepherd Ministries that has a table in the back if you're interested, and you go to those countries and you see the need around you and they all need your help, what we do is we wear like these blinders that says, God, let me just see what you want me to do here. Although our compassion is for many, we know that we are called to the few select that God has for us. And that's how this nurse was. God, I can't help her. She's too old. She's too sick. I can't help her. So she actually got up and was starting to walk away, and she said two things happened that changed her mind. One was, as she was trying to walk away, she felt like her legs were built with cement. They would not move. They were so heavy. And as she's trying to figure out why is the lower part of my body feeling so heavy, she said, now you need to understand, this nurse is a very quiet Lutheran woman from Sweden. She is not like some in the Christian circles that, you know, feel that God speaks to them even when they burp. She doesn't, she's not in that realm. But she said that day, she heard an audible voice. And this voice said three words. She is mine. Many years later, I came to know the God of the universe. And as we know about God, he is so massive, the galaxies worship him on a daily basis. The word of God says that he's so big that even this earth he uses at his footstool. And yet he's so intimate. He sees the prodigal son. He sees the lone sheep that has wandered from the 99 others. 
He sees the woman that has committed adultery. He sees the taxpayer that is longing to be seen and recognized. He sees the hearts of everyone, and he comes down, and he wants to be intimate with us, and he is so intimate with us that in the garbage moment of our life, the heavens cry out and say, she is mine. She heard that voice. <laughs> she rescued me, nursed me back to life, and placed me in an orphanage. Now, I need to be very careful in how I speak about orphanages. The reason why I work with the organization that I work with is this. I do not believe in institutions. Yes, there are people that work in institutions that have a great heart. But a child gets lost in an institution. They may get fed. They may even get clothing. They may even get schooling. And they may get medical help. But the complexity of how God creates us, where our, where our mind, body, and spirit needs to connect before we can function as a whole person, cannot come in an institution. And in an institution where you put many children that come from the backgrounds like I came from, and you're trying to survive in an institution, sometimes the worst comes out in the children. And so what I experienced in the institution wasn't much better than what I experienced in the, in the streets, except that it was confined within walls. It was so confined within walls that I couldn't escape from it. But in this institution, I was taught about God and about Jesus. And when, he, when they, the preacher talked about love, I couldn't, there was just no part of my DNA that could absorb it and say, what does love feel like? What does love look like? I don't understand. And besides, I'm a mistake. If God so loved the world, I'm a mistake. I'm different. He came to die for children like this and for people like this, but he didn't come for me. But I still like going to church. One day, the director of the orphanage said, there is an American couple that is coming to this orphanage, and they want to take a little baby to America with them. Can you get all the children ready? And I now, I'm about five, nine years of age, I have become a worker in that orphanage. And these babies, I love with everything. If I knew what love was, it was that. They could do nothing, they were helpless, and I wanted to help them. And we got all the little children ready, and I'll never forget the bell of the gate ringing, and we had a little gate that most people went in and out of, and, that one of the workers went and opened up the little gate and he shut the little gate and he opened up the big gate. Now in Sunday school, I had heard the story of David and Goliath and I knew that little David had killed Goliath. I had seen the nurse that had rescued me from the garbage heap and I knew that people with blue eyes probably did not see the world the same as how I did. I had seen American soldiers wandering on the streets. I knew that they all came in different shapes and sizes. But this man, he was the most hugest man I had ever seen. Not only was he tall, he was almost as round as he was tall. Now, in Asia at that time, only people that had a little extra weight on them were people that had food to eat, so they were rich. I'm looking at this man coming through this big gate, and I'm thinking, Mr. Goliath and Mr. Billionaire. I'm watching this, and he steps aside, and in walks Mrs. Goliath. They go to this little crib little basket, and Mr. Goliath goes down and he picks up a little baby and he tucks it under his neck just like this. He's talking in this funny language, talking to his wife, and she's doing the same thing, 
they're just giggling and laughing and crying and doing all the things that, you know, parents do when they know that they're going to take a little baby home. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with these people? Now, for the five years from the time my mom had left me at the train station to this couple that was in this courtyard of the orphanage, I had gone through everything that no child should ever experience. And in the orphanage, I still had the residue of those five years. I still had dirt caked all over my body. I had boils on me. I had scabs on me. I had a scar that went down my face. I had a lazy eye. I had lice so bad in my hair that it was more white than dark. I had a worm so bad in my stomach that when they got hungry, they would crawl out of my throat. He saw me, this giant, from the corner of his eyes. He put that baby back in the crib. He turned around to where I was. Now, not only was he a giant, but he was a man. I hated men. And I'm getting ready to run because I think he's going to grab me and squeeze the life out of me. But I see him bending down as low as he could get. I'm nine years old, but I weigh just a little over 30 pounds. And he comes down to where I am, and he takes out his big arm and his big hand, and he lays it on my face just like this. Live, little girl, live. Live, little girl, live. Live, little girl, live. I didn't know what this touch felt like. I don't ever remember being touched like this. This is a good touch, right? I want you not to take this hand away. Live, little girl, live. Live, little girl, live. But because of my anger and because of my abuse and because of my abandonment and because of my bitterness, I yanked the hand off my face and I looked up at him and I spit on him. They came back the next day and took me home with them. How do we affect the orphan crisis? We affect the orphan crisis with this, that every child has a destiny. Every child has been given the mandate to live. Every child has been rescued as far as heaven is concerned. And he has created you and I to be their advocates. He has created you and I to be their rescuers. God has created you and I to be their voice. Maybe in some countries it's a fatherless society, but for orphans it's a parentless society. It is a society where there is no infrastructure to help them in any way. If a child is left here in Columbus, Ohio, they may go through some hardships, but they will not be left there abandoned. The human resource would be right there to pick them up. But in countries like Haiti and Ethiopia and so many other countries, when a child is abandoned on a street corner, and he or she isn't rescued, they will die within several days. And if they don't die, they will know nothing but poverty and disgrace for the rest of their lives. No child deserves that. And every organization that's represented here today has a different heartbeat. For us at LSM, we believe that every child needs a permanent home, whether it's through adoption or whether it's placing them in a home situation in the country of their birth. We believe that every child that walks the streets in Ethiopia that sells her body just to make 25 cents deserves to be given a chance to be able to be trained so that she can provide for her family. You are here not just to hear a foster story, 
or an orphan story. You're here because God has motivated you to say, do you remember, son? Do you remember, daughter, when I adopted you? Do you remember how I had to walk with you to go back to the past of your life and let you see that you felt like you were all alone, but because of me inside of you, you can go back together and you see that I was there all the time giving you an ability and a strength. And then that day when you said, yes, I want to belong to your family. And at that point where I, you, my blood ran through you, you're not a tuggy anymore. You're not a throwaway anymore. You're not abandoned anymore. You're not rejected anymore. You're not betrayed anymore. Do you remember that feeling? For every orphan that sees someone stepping into their shoes and saying, take my hand. I had no idea when my parents came to take me home what they were taking me home to. I thought I was going to be a bond servant. Who knew what this big giant of a man would do to me? I had no sense of security when they took me home. And I waited day after day after day for them to put me to work or to do something even more tragic with me. But all they kept doing was bathing me and bathing me and bathing me and bathing me and finally shaving my head because they couldn't get rid of the lice and they deworming me and it just seemed like you know, I was this guinea pig. But they loved me. Every night they stuck me in a little bed that I had never slept in that I fell off of every night. <laughs> and in their funny English that I didn't understand but I knew by their touch and the way that they stroked me. And my body was repelled by it, but my spirit leaned into it. And I'm so glad that somewhere in that childhood, I learned to listen to this spirit. Because as I began to listen to this spirit, it was like, they're safe. They're safe. They're safe. Oh, it took them many years <laughs> to hear the words out of my mouth that said, Daddy. I love you. But when I said it, I meant it with all my heart, and I knew at that moment what love felt like. And now I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother. I'm a wife. I'm an advocate for the 153 millions of orphans that's around the world. And I know that there, he is no respecter of people. And just as much as he loved me, he loves every one of them. And his cry is, who's going to be the one to rescue them? Not all of us can have children in our homes, although I believe every table should have a few. But give in whatever way God has asked you to give. And I believe, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, there will be more Stephanie's standing on platforms saying what Satan meant for evil, God intended for good to bring about the salvation of the 153 million orphans. Do you believe that God has called you? I believe he has.